Phil's accomplishments are many, but his true gift is his message. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please extend a warm Alaskan welcome to Chief Phil Lane. Tough teaching to take. 
I'll tell you, I haven't mastered the whole deal. <laughs> I remember back uh, when I went through my kind of a spiritual honeymoon back in uh, 1967. In fact, it was May 20th, 1967. I went through this spiritual experience. And I'll tell you what, I was all of a sudden, all this alcohol, drugs, and Healthy relationship with women, you name it, I had it. <laughs> and the reason why I laugh, by the way, before I go on with the story, I'll put a bookmark right there. I put a bookmark because I might forget what I'm going to say to you, but I want to put a little sidebar on here. You know, the greatest disease to have in the entire world is addiction. There is no greater disease than addiction to have it. Because the only way out is a spiritual path. The only way out of the spiritual path, the only way out is to surrender totally and completely into the hands of the Creator, in the hands of God, however name you want to call it. So it's something we should be able to celebrate, to think the Creator picked us out to be an addict, to be an alcoholic, to be a drug addict. In my case, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that's all the more spiritual growth you get to do. In fact, I think I'd better remember where I was in that story. I almost forgot it now, so I don't know if it's going I want to sing a song here to honor your view and your elders, and especially womankind. Because it's been the women of our communities that have kept us going through thick and thin. They're the ones that have given us birth. They're the ones that represent Mother Earth. And they're the ones who, you can get rid of all of us, but without a woman, this life would not continue. I'm talking about men. <laughs> now, it does say also, though, the wings of the eagle have two wings. One is men and one is women. And both wings of the eagle must have equal power, respect, and honor for the eagle of humanity to fly the heights. We both are sacred. We both must play our role. So I'm going to sing uh, a couple of songs because I want to talk about, I think these are simple songs, but they have a lot of meanings. The first one, very simple. It says, My Ankiye, Shinukakile wa Kayalo, My Ankiye. My uncle calls upon the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, to come and behold us here. Then Shinoo Bakile Wakanyalo says, the sacred pipe is holy. And what it's really saying is, is everything symbolic. It's all the minerals and the water that represent the gold. That's it. And the stem, which represent the plant people, all the plants and trees, they're sacred. But that's the reason why you live in such a sacred place like Uther. Miles, hundreds of miles, beautiful green trees. And then, you always have different animals conducted to these, uh, connected to these bundles. It says the animal people, they're sacred. If you turn the pipe up, here's the mouth and body, we're sacred. We are sacred. Each of us is a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. Each of us. Each of us. So I want to sing that song first. And this is just to honor each one of us. Like they say, the most sacred ceremony of all ceremonies is the birth of a child. This grandma told me this, looked in my eyes and said, Then who are you? I was the only person there. <laughs> and except each of us is a sacred being, no matter how we might feel some days. And by the way, that's another great thing about being an addict. You have the disease of alcoholism or drug abuse or whatever it is. You can have bad days. It's okay to feel bad sometimes. It's just so that you know a good day is coming. As long as we keep praying, as long as we keep getting up, I don't care if we get knocked down. A thousand times. If 
we get up a thousand times, we get up a tiny time stronger. So I'll sing this song very briefly. <laughs> It's already sacred. 
What we're doing is being able to recognize it's sacred. <laughs> the Creator made it sacred, just like He made us sacred. Each one of us. And then it says, the Creator's going to see you. See you. Now, I can't explain this mystery of life. This power that pervades all living things. This power that is everywhere, at all times, the everywhere spirit. But it's there. It's there now. It's been there. And it'll be there with us forever. And then it says, when one sits in the circle of people, one must be responsible. One must take the place. And then it says, if you do it that way, the best you can, whatever you ask for, that's exactly the way it's going to be. And we've got to proceed as such. We've got to proceed with full faith. No matter how many of the challenges have come on our path, because I remember back, I'm sharing with you the story, I'm coming back to it now. When I put a little, little marker over here, I remember it now. It was back when I first went through my spiritual honeymoon. Has anybody been through a spiritual honeymoon? It's like all of a sudden, you got it. Boy, you feel holy. I really feel sacred. Whoa! You know, oh, gee, all this stuff fell away from me, and, and I felt like, I felt so good, happy, and joyful, and, and all the kind of things that were bothering me fell away from me, and so forth. People didn't want to come around me. They said, you know, Phil, we come around you, pray for us when you go to the bath, when you come to your house, go to the bath, we pray for us, we'll give you, give you a glass of water, we pray for us. You know, you're kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> so I went down to Bolivia um, to work uh, and, and collaborate with me with the Catch What I Mara village down in Bolivia. And so every morning, I'll take it up and pray. And I really pray. I had this uh, people I was going to forgive, General, General George Armstrong Custer. <laughs> I did. Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I really did have this list of the, of the people I, I thought, these are the most terrible people that I've ever heard of, but I want to forgive them somehow. So I kept praying to Peter, please teach me to be forgiven. Please teach me to be forgiven. And so I went on and on like that. Well, if you're going to learn to be forgiven, what has to happen to you? If you really pray to be forgiven, what really has to happen to you? Injustice, pain, hurt. You can't, unless you have something to forgive, you can't forgive. <laughs> it sounds funny now, but over the time. And so, three months I was praying. I won't go into the whole story, I have to say it. I was there working with our Keshua relatives, and I went to a meeting. And this old man met me, who was my elder there, and first told me a different prophecies. He said, you know, uh, brother, he said, I think we should have this meeting at your house. And I said, no, I think we should go ahead and have it at our vision center. And so all the relatives were coming in, about 35 brothers were coming in from the combo, were sitting there praying and so forth. And this drunk guy, well, I had to be in a blackout. We've done this a lot. Uh, rang the doorbell. It was a long passage back to the, uh, our house. Rang the bell. My wife, my beloved wife, came open the door, and he brutally raped her there um, at the door, inside the door of this path, pathway. Now, she said that when this happened, it's like she left her body. And all she could think of, I've got to get to him to fill. Well, anyway, in the, in the very end, uh, I ended up catching him. And I remember when I had him down, I just, I knocked him down, I pulled back, and my young days, I used to be pretty strong. I worked when I was 12 years old. And I pulled back, and I'll tell you, 
I want to drive like this straight through his face. And all of a sudden, the voice said, Be sick. And I looked at his face, and I saw my face. If it wasn't the grace of God, there go me. And I never did do that, but anybody but. And so I grabbed him, threw him up anyway. They put him in, uh, in jail down in Cochabamba, Bolivia. After 100 days, his, his family was very wealthy. We were able to get him out and uh, buy off the judges and buy off a lot of witnesses and so forth. Now, I tell that story not to hurt anybody's feelings, but to say that really gave me uh, an opportunity to be forgiven. <laughs> And I thought about it. I said, what have you been praying for? You've been praying to be forgiving. You've been praying to be forgiving, and so that which is most precious to you, most beloved to you, has been hurt. And I remember later, um, I carried I carried this for many, many years, probably 40 years. Probably still carry a little bit today. That's why I'm talking about it, probably. <laughs> but I know that my my wife. We're no longer together. Uh, this, this incident kind of just tore the relationship up. But we're very, very good friends. And not very long afterwards, she says, Phil, she says, I have forgiveness. You have to forgive this. But you know, forgiveness is not something that's easy. It is not easy. It is one of the greatest, greatest challenges any human being can have. And I think that's why the story of Jesus has such an impact because it's about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness. And we have our own stories from everywhere in the world, from every spiritual tradition. They have the stories about forgiveness. So I want to say, be careful what you pray for. <laughs> <laughs> because whatever we pray for will come to us. Will come to us. And sometimes it comes to us in ways that may not quite like it. <laughs> but in the end, if we keep having faith, if we keep having prayer, and keep moving forward, like it says, if you, if that psalm says, if you get knocked down once, get up. If you get knocked down a thousand times, get up a thousand times. If it's a thousand and one, get up a thousand and one. <laughs> we know that. We know that. So there should be no one in this room, no one in this room, how many times you give this a try, this road to sobriety, there should be nobody in this room that should feel hopeless. Because at the right time, in the right time, in the right place, and we've got to hang with it once we get it, we will leave behind all our addictions. That's a promise from God. That's a promise from Creator. If we follow this path, the Creator's laid out for us, we will become severed and free from all that's saved from Creator. And we'll see with the Creator's eyes, and we'll hear with the Creator's ears, and we'll speak the Creator's words, and we'll feel the joy of that Holy Spirit. Now, we won't be the Creator. <laughs> Going a little bit overboard, I think. <clears throat> but um, we'll certainly be a ray of the Creator's love and kindness and compassion. Back in 1982, um, we began a program up in Canada called the National Navy Alcohol Drug Abuse Program. And the new director had heard about some of the work we were doing at the University of Lethbridge. So he flew out there and he said, Phil, he said, uh, we've heard you've been doing some work down in Seattle and other places. Do you think you could develop a curriculum for helping us in all those programs? And I said, well, I said, by that time I'd wake up a little bit. I said, that's an awful, that's a big response, that's a big job. I said, we have so many tribes and nations. I said, I'll tell you what, though. If you'll allow me to use, get some end-of-the-year money. Ever, ever had end-of-the-year money? Ever heard of it? Not anymore. <laughs> so, 
of us older people who got into your money? <laughs> now, okay, we get to the end of the year. <laughs> well, they used to have a deal where, you know, they might have to spend their money and then the government wouldn't quite spend their money and whoever would spend their money. And they all of a sudden, they give that little extra money and get to spend the money. So, that's yeah, in the air money. And uh, I tell you what, I said, if you'll let me use that money any way I wish, I'll give this a little try. But I want to be able to bring in elders and spiritual leaders and get to seek their guidance, seek their understanding. Because we don't get me, the indigenous peoples of Mother Earth have the key for the future. And until we enter the chambers and sit at the sacred tables of the consultations of all human beings, humanity will not get through this crisis wave right now. Because we also have a gift here, just like every, every other member of the human family. We have an understanding of Mother Earth. We have an understanding of spirit. We have an understanding of life. We have to make our contributions to the human family as well. So these elders came. And we met together for four days and four nights the first time. And they came from many different tribes, spoke different languages. In fact, I believe almost all 40 of those elders have gone on to spiritual work. They're here with us. You can see the results of their work. And their prayers are gone. And after we listened very carefully to what they had to say, it came down very simple. They said this. They said this world we live in, this universe we live in, is organized according to certain natural laws. And these physical and spiritual laws are inseparably connected. They're connected that the physical laws are easy to understand. If you went and crawled up or walked up a 10-story building and jumped off, you'd get a pretty good day. If you drank a glass of arsenic, you'd get a pretty good stomach. If you drove a car 100 miles an hour against a wall that was made out of concrete, Got to get smashed up. <laughs> get smashed up. These are natural laws. One of the natural laws is we're only here for a short time, for instance, in a physical sense. And we wear out. <laughs> I keep looking at Doug here. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at Doug because I'm looking back at myself. There was a time back one day, believe it or not, he had black hair. <laughs> So did I. <laughs> he was about three, three inches smaller. So that I was about six feet. <laughs> His plumbing was 100%. <laughs> Mine's not so good anymore. <clears throat> but we're only here for a short time. That's a physical law. And we go on this journey. Infancy. We're all born. Smiling. Welcome ourselves to the world, and then we go into childhood, and then we go pretty soon into adolescence and go into young adulthood. Pretty soon we take that journey to our from young adults, and all of a sudden we end up being elders. And then you look in the mirror and say, "What in the world happened? <laughs> what happened? Really?" When my dad first told me. Son, we're only here for a short time. I had no idea what he was talking about. We're only here for a brief moment. No, 600 years is nothing. Just 60 times 10. That's all. Nothing. This is about 69 now. <clears throat> and I look back, I understand what old book books said. He said, Life, he said, Life's like a breath of a buffalo in a cold wind. Or a fire fire, a warm summer night. The shadows vanishing in 40 seconds. That's it. It goes away. 
But at the same time, the elders all said in their own way, there's also spiritual laws, spiritual principles that are the foundation of this physical world. And these principles guide how we develop as human beings and as communities and as a human family. And so they said, if you can learn to become these spiritual principles, these spiritual laws, and apply them to all things in your life, as best you can, eventually, eventually, you will grow infancy, childhood, adulthood, right this adulthood place. You know, I look at that spot now. You can see the race. That, the race. How many, how many of you ever ran on like 400 meters or one time? How many times people ran one time around the track? Most people? I mean, whether you jog or walk or whatever. Well, that's the 400 meters. And so you see it. You look at an elder, you say, ah, oh, there it goes. Born over here, came over here, came over here, came over here. And now I'm here. And right there is the doorway out of here. <laughs> When you get about 68 or so, you don't know how many more days you got. <laughs> Already, my, uh, Bill, my good brothers, Bill Lucas, many others, gone. All those elders that gave us this guidance on the spiritual world. Now, the way I figure it, though, is this. Where do you have to run your best race? At the beginning? Where do you have to run the best part of your race? At the end. At the end. That's where you have to run your best race. You got to make run between the end of the race, you got to kind of keep going along the way here. But this last part of the race for me, I decided this is going to be my best part. That's when you really got to bear down. That's when you got to kick it. Because that's the example we need to leave for our young people. You gotta dance. We gotta get this kid out of Shirley Eagles. He says, Well, boy, I was a good dance last night. I can just see her out there just kicking it up. Just kicking it up. That's good. I can see Doug and Amy just kicking it up. And others, these other elders. Because we, we are the curriculum. We elders are the curriculum for the younger people. If we, if our faces look like life is just one disaster after another followed by death, they go to hell and burn forever, that's what our young people look like. <laughs> well, I look like this all the time. <laughs> so we are the curriculum. Books are great, videos are great, but it's our own self mirroring back each other. How much we love each other, how much we care, how much we feel.